In Corporita Bonanza with Hanan Awad, we will talk about several topics and we will meet successful people and experts in many fields to learn about their success stories and learn from them how to empower ourselves and stimulate our creativity. We will also review important books that enriched our lives. This program is for you. Whether you are an employee or searching for your next big opportunity or managing a business or a student or a parent. I'm Hanan Awad. The world is my canvas and success is my paint. Connect with me and my guests at president at corporita.ca. In Corporita Bonanza, we will learn from each other and we will grow together. Hello everyone, I'm Hanan Awad, Editor-in-Chief of Corporate Magazine and your host for Corporate Bonanza, where we meet amazing people and dig for gold nuggets of knowledge and wisdom. Today with me, I'm having uh, Laura May Lindu, the Director of the Diversity and Equity at Le uh, Wolf Wilfrid Laurier uh, University and the nominee for the NDP for Kitchener Center and she wears so many hats and we will start by asking her how many hats do you how wear? Many hats? <laughs> I wear many many hats so I'm the director of diversity and equity at Laurier um, very recent just yesterday uh, nominated to represent Kitchener Center for the NDP um, in the provincial election I'm a mother yeah. I have three <laughs> lovely children yeah. 12 9 and 2 yeah what other hats I was a musician. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to get back into that, into yeah. the artsy side, which yeah. is lovely. Yeah. I don't know what other hats. Those. Are, let's <laughs> okay, leave it we, for hats. Yeah, we will dis <laughs> we will discover them. We will discover them. So, uh, Laura, you have a PhD from York University, and your thesis was very interesting. I have to share this with you. Black stand-up comedians and what they teach us about race and racial identity. What can we learn <laughs> from comedians? Um, so I did my doctorate in uh, faculty of education mm -hmm. and my hypothesis was that there were a group of uh, African-American stand-up comedians that used their platform to talk about race and racism and somehow they were getting large audiences like thousands of people following them and coming out to their shows. So I had this idea that if I analyzed the techniques that they used mm -hmm. and taught that to developing teachers, mm -hmm. then those teachers would feel more comfortable and confident talking about race and racism in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And so I started to do an analysis of the stand-up comedians. I would go to New York and watch uh, people like Paul Mooney, who mm -hmm. is best friends with Richard Pryor and one of his writers and wrote for Ch uh, Dave Chappelle and, mm -hmm. and such. Um, got to meet Dave Chappelle at one point and did an analysis of how they do it mm -hmm. because it wasn't just that they were talking about race and racism but that they were doing it in a way that made us feel comfortable talking about something uncomfortable yes and I think that one of the things that stands in the way in our educational system uh, from talking about social justice issues is that we're so uncomfortable with what makes us uncomfortable that mm -hmm. we stop talking yeah. So trying to pull out some of those techniques to get students, uh, teachers that were going to become the teachers of the future, ready to talk about things that make them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. so we watched a lot of comedy, mm -hmm. um, laughed a lot, even about things that were problematic, mm -hmm. because that's part of what a comedian does, is that they get your laughter out. Mm -hmm. And then they get you to start to reflect on why you laugh. Yes. What you, what part did you laugh yes. at, and that kind of thing. Yes. And did an analysis of that. Yes. It was actually a wonderful experience. Yes. Um, and when I later on moved, oh, there's another hat. I was uh -huh. a professor for a while, and <laughs> yes. I teach in the university. <laughs> yeah. But I moved to uh, the University of Prince Edward Island, mm -hmm. and was asked actually to replicate the project there. So mm -hmm. I had an opportunity to do it again with another group of students, mm -hmm. and they they loved it. 
because mm -hmm. it became an entryway into talking about something that they, their, their heart wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. They want to take up these issues when they see their students struggling. Mm -hmm. They just didn't know how. Mm -hmm. And so it gave them more tools for their toolbox, I think. Yeah. And this um, uh, leads to my my next question because most of your uh, uh, career you, you spend it in let's say the educational system yeah. or or academia. Um, what are the new trends or advances that we see recently in this field? Um, that's a really interesting question at a very interesting time. Um, I have spent a lot of time within post-secondary sectors but because I'm in a faculty of education I'm or I often was in a faculty of education the students that were coming in were preparing themselves to be out in the world mm -hmm. doing other kinds of professions so it wasn't that they, their plan wasn't to go on and do PhDs or masters and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff it was to go into the school system mm -hmm. And so I felt very connected even externally mm -hmm. uh, from the post-secondary sector externally to the elementary, middle school, and high school, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then I was also doing a lot of uh, alternative educational work. Mm -hmm. So for instance, at one point I did some work with uh, students that were in and out of uh, prison. Mm -hmm. And so working with kids that... At risk. Oh yeah, yeah. at risk, youth. Yeah. and. They were ready to make a change, but the system wouldn't allow them in because of their past behaviors. Yeah. And so there had to be ways. It was actually some really strong educators that said, we can't leave these kids behind. Yeah. We have to do something. So yeah. they would find alternative spaces to teach them whatever they needed so that at the very minimum, when they became, uh, like when they were 21 or so, then they could apply as an adult mm -hmm. coming into the post-secondary sector or college or wherever they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. So I tell you all of that, um, to go back to your question, yep. I think about all of the different places that we are educated, mm -hmm. as opposed to thinking of trends just sort of inside the system. Mm -hmm. I think that there's more of a push to think externally. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, government wanting experiential learning to be available for all students. So experiential Experiential learning, learning yeah. yeah. And the, I, the concept, there's still some people that are grappling with what that actually means. Mm -hmm. But I think overall, we can all agree that it means giving students experience, work experience that they mm -hmm. can take into their work life. It's very interesting yeah. because today I signed uh, the papers to hire an intern, high school. Fantastic. Intern. So, yeah, for 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 a couple of years, I was dealing with universities and colleges, and yeah. now we are dealing with with the school, high school board students. It's, yeah, you know what? And it's a beautiful opportunity. Yeah, the high school students have what I think it's for. I might be making this up, but I think it's forty hours or something like that of community service that they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, but but with this program, I believe they have to report two hundred twenty work hours. Wow, fantastic! Yes. Fantastic. Yes. yes. So though that is actually one major trend, I think, in the mm -hmm. post-secondary sector right now. I think there was a time where college was considered the space mm -hmm. for the hands-on learning and mm -hmm. university was where you would go just to think about life mm -hmm. and reflect in different ways and whatnot, yeah. <laughs> and it was all in theory. Um, but now that shifted. Yeah. Uh, to the point that we're realizing because people are getting degrees and not getting jobs, mm -hmm. we have to do something differently. We still have to make sure that anybody who graduates mm -hmm. with the amount of money that they're spending on tuition, yep. that they are job ready. Yep. And so how can we do that? So that's one major trend that's coming mm -hmm. forward. Um, and I would say especially in places that you may not anticipate mm -hmm. that there would be an experiential learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. So for instance, we know if you're doing something in business that that would be part of your degree. It would mm -hmm. make sense for you to be able to have an opportunity to work outside. Mm -hmm. But what if you're a woman in gender studies graduate? Mm -hmm. I think that they too need to have an opportunity to have those kinds of experiences to work somewhere even in, in a department like my own, yeah. um, a diversity and equity office, where yeah. they'd be able to actually apply what they're learning theoretically in the real world. Yeah. I 
I think that that, that trend, the mm -hmm. sort of the attempt to actually make uh, policies and practices that would bridge the theory and practice gap, mm -hmm. it's a huge step forward. Mm -hmm. It'll be difficult to navigate, but it is one that's really important. Another big trend I think right now, and why I was saying earlier that the question comes at such an interesting time, mm -hmm is the climate that we're trying to educate our students in. Mm -hmm. So we've got a rise of Islamophobia. Yep. We have a rise of uh, anti-black racism. It's making us have to even think differently about what we, what we mean when we speak about racism. Mm -hmm. Because when I think of Islamophobia, I'm not only thinking about race, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of some racial others, but I'm also thinking of that intersection between race and spirituality. Yep. And so those are very different, that's a different kind of climate mm -hmm. to talk about anti-racism work or anti-oppression work in, in a university college or out, even outside of that now. Um, I think there was an article that I read uh, last week about a small group of people who were protesting against students, like mm -hmm. they went to an elementary school, I believe it was in Mississauga, mm -hmm. um, angry about Muslim students and were protesting out front of a, a school. That's an elementary school. Yeah. So when we're living in a climate where people believe that this is okay, there comes a, a shift that we have to accept, um, I would say an honor and respect in the university system. We are a multicultural and diverse country and for 40 years uh, we took pride in, in this. But with the recent development uh, in our social systems and the, uh, the new advances in our communities, do you think that we need to look to multiculturalism and diversity through a new lens? Yeah, I, it's interesting because I have been speaking a lot to some of my colleagues about this, especially as we're approaching um, Canada's 150th birthday. And in light of the fact that we've got such powerful documents like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report yep. talking about the, the history of uh, colonization and anti-indigeneity and the ways that those have been embedded into our laws and policies, um, it makes me think a lot about how deeply embedded uh, Canada has crafted their narrative mm -hmm. in this notion of multiculturalism mm -hmm. and at this point when we're having the kinds of issues in the in the world around us that we're having I do think that there's some concerns that we don't know what will come next mm -hmm. um, I think that the there were always critiques of multiculturalism in the academy in particular, yep. always, always. Yep. Um, who is the Canadian mm -hmm. and who, and that's the backdrop. But even among the, 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 the regular people in, in, yeah. in the street, yeah. Oh yeah, for sure, yeah. because there's an, there's an understanding, like I am Canadian, born and raised in Scarborough, Ontario, but when I stand up and say I'm Canadian, I don't appear mm -hmm. as that vision of what a Canadian would look like. Yeah. I'm black, which is already number one, that yeah. says that I am other. So when I think, I remember when I was young in school and they would teach us about multiculturalism, and there was always this image of, uh, it would be on white paper or mm -hmm. whatever, so of the white backdrop, and then the circles represented all the other multicultural others, mm -hmm. and the backdrop, was tolerant of the others mm -hmm. and so uh, as I got older and started to think uh, a little bit more critically mm -hmm. about what I had been taught I started to I started to wonder about the language of tolerance mm -hmm. like what does that mean mm -hmm. um, I know people that tolerate asparagus mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean they like it it means yeah. that, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's so, like that analogy. Yeah. yeah, so why are we using that word? Yeah. And what what is the impact of that? And who's doing the tolerating? Yeah. And then, uh, as I learned more, even about Black Canadian history, I realized that the first um, 
African to come from Africa to uh, what would then become Canadian soil mm -hmm. uh, was in 1605 or 1608. Oh, okay. So how do we have people who have been here who, for instance, for look like me, mm -hmm. who have been here since 1605 well, and, still, years. Yeah, yep. and still not see that as Canadian? Yeah. Um, when I th and then when you, again, pit that, those two narratives against the reality of how Canada became Canada, mm -hmm. a history of colonial, uh, colonialism, and an ongoing story of colonization, because mm -hmm. I don't believe that that has ended. That's not our his it's not history. It's, it's, still, it's still happening. Yeah. It's just happening in different ways that nobody wants to talk about. Mm -hmm. Streaming in schools, high uh, incarceration rates, the two yeah. groups that have the highest incarceration rates are racialized people and indigenous people. Yeah. And yet, when you think about the, the percentage of those groups in Canada, it makes no sense. Mm -hmm. The, the over-representation in our criminal justice system is a real testament mm -hmm. to how colonization continues. Yeah. Well, I, I have a personal observation about our educational system. So at, at, at the class, you will see um, uh, lots of kids from different ethnicities and yeah. backgrounds. And at the same time, you look at this, the, the, the teaching uh, team and the, uh, the administrative team, and they are all, um, you know, fit a mm -hmm. certain uh, category or, or certain um, uh, uh, image. And you cannot see the, the, the diversity of the classroom represented yeah. in the teaching staff who are teaching them. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting that because um, there was a time when the way that we explained that, uh, it could be that people aren't interested in teaching, maybe mm -hmm. it's just that certain groups don't want to become the teachers, who knows. Mm -hmm. But over time when you look at uh, the longevity and impact of streaming mm -hmm. in the educational system mm -hmm. that becomes a different kind of explanation as to yes. why you're not seeing um, different people become those teachers yeah so if I've got a child who is uh, a racialized child or an indigenous child who's not being given the same kind of access to high caliber education as mm -hmm. their white peer. And that's starting as early as um, kindergarten, when there's actual statistics that show that um, racial, racialized, and in particular black uh, boys, mm -hmm. are more, uh, are highly likely to be more disciplined and so there's harsher discipline for their mm -hmm. behaviors from even young ages than for their white peers. Even before they even develop before done a rebellion personality or yes. something like this. Oh my God, yes. that's, that's interesting. And so the, it's, sometimes it's a matter of what comes first, the chicken or the egg, because yeah. the reality is we, as you've pointed out, there are more, uh, the teaching staff are less diverse than the students. Yeah they're going through a system that socializes them to have particular opinions about why a child acts out if mm -hmm. they're a racialized child mm -hmm. versus a white child. So there's, they're already, in, that's ingrained. So they, they, they come to the workplace with, with this perception or this um, maybe hidden belief that yeah. can dictate how they behave towards kids. Yes. Okay. And the and so when there's some people use the terminology of unconscious bias. Yes. Right? So it's yeah. not that they're <clears throat> overtly believing this to be true. Mm -hmm. It's that this is the inner working mm -hmm. of their mind. So when they see the two children playing and one acts out and that child happens to be white Mm -hmm. They'll take their time and, well, what's bugging the child? What mm -hmm. is it that's going on? It's, you know, the, the kid is only five. Mm -hmm. Maybe they've had a rough day. Maybe they're tired. Maybe they didn't go to bed in time. Maybe they woke up in the night. Mm -hmm. A bunch of rationales, mm -hmm. which I think are all valid for mm -hmm. why a five-year-old would act out. But a five-year-old 
acts out and they're black and they're a boy Mm -hmm. And so un that unconscious, unconscious bias, bias comes says, to the play. oh yeah. yes, and it's in those moments that a five-year-old is disciplined, put into special education, told that they cannot, uh, they're not monitoring their emotions well, okay. they, so we need to provide mm -hmm. them with additional support. So if we're doing that at five, when that child now goes into high school and is deciding where, if they get through the high school system, mm -hmm. and they decide where they're going to go, are they going to actually follow through and go to university or college if they've had a whole line of teachers mm -hmm. that have believed that they were not equipped, not able to manage their emotions, not smart enough to read the books at this level, all of that. So they slowly but surely get streamed out of the, the pathway that would lead them mm -hmm. to university. If they're not in university, they can't access teacher's college. Mm -hmm. If they don't access teacher's college, then they aren't going to become teachers. Yeah. And so then we end up in that same, what comes first. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so I think in, in um, the past, we've kind of looked to the, we've not looked to the root cause mm -hmm. to solve the problem. We've looked at other places mm -hmm. and tried to fix it there. Mm -hmm. So our teaching staff isn't diverse. Well, let's do more training with the teaching staff to help them to better support the diverse students, mm -hmm. which is great because our teaching staff now has to learn but how it, to yeah, cope. Yeah, but it's not it's enough. Not, you need to diversify the teaching staff. This is it. This is it. Yeah. So it's not solving the problem. And I yeah. think that it also perpetuates another narrative that we have here, mm -hmm. which is certain people are meant to, um, they're the ones that have the authority mm -hmm. and they're the ones that are meant to be teaching and mm -hmm. they're the ones that are going to dictate mm -hmm. how this multicultural group of students mm -hmm. will operate in the world. Mm -hmm. And though nobody wants to really talk mm -hmm. about that, that's a reality. Mm -hmm. Yesterday actually at the nomination meeting um, for the NDP, there was uh, the vice president of the Kitchener Centre Riding Association mm -hmm. was speaking at the end <clears throat> and mentioned that it wasn't until she was in university that she for the first time saw a professor who looked like her, oh, okay. who was brown like yeah. she was brown. And yeah. actually the, the professor that she was speaking of was in the room at the time. Yeah. And to have somebody stand up and say that again and again and again, because people are saying it all the time. Yeah. The Black Liberation Collective was saying that all the time. Mm -hmm. That's a group of black and indigenous students in, in universities and colleges um, across North America mm -hmm. that are demanding that, that universities and colleges diversify their faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. We're back to the same issue, mm -hmm. where the root cause of that is that streaming is happening so early mm -hmm. that we'll never get to that point if we don't fix that initial problem, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Yes, yes, and the discussion, I believe, it's it's um, it's sensitive, it's charged, and it it has some emotional um, uh, heavy yeah. uh, side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because we are we are talking still about multiculturalism and and, um, and uh, diversity um, and. Part of it is integration and social cohesion, and there are many factors as we as we discussed mm -hmm. to to build this strong and social integration. So, how can we address those inequalities in our society? Uh, you mentioned something about to be comfortable with the uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but is it enough only to to talk about these things, or I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud, what yeah. can we do to, to, to understand what social cohesion looks like mm -hmm. and how we can reach this stage? So, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> I no wish one, I yeah. did. <laughs> no but one I has. But I, I think that talking for the sake of talking mm -hmm. is never enough. Mm -hmm. Talking for the sake of building a solution collaboratively mm -hmm. is always enough. Yes, I and love this. I think yeah. that's part of it. So yeah. there, there is a tendency to think that if we just speak about it, then we've solved the problem. Mm -hmm. And what I do find is that that has led us to do things like have, um, we'll have community engagement sessions mm -hmm. about a particular issue. 
and we will allow the people that have been harmed to speak about their pain mm -hmm. and then we will all go home. Yeah. And it's not that we're speaking about it to figure out what it is that we need to do. Mm -hmm. It's just to talk. Yeah. That's not going to get us anywhere. Yeah. And I think that that's part of what prompts people to protest mm -hmm. because they've spoken enough. Yeah. When I think about the background of um, groups like Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. um, or Idle No More, mm -hmm. part of the reason that you have these kinds of uprisings mm -hmm. is because all people are doing is talking. Because they are frustrated. They're frustrated. They've been talking for all these years That's and it. nothing actual happens. That's right. Yeah. And I think, I wish I could remember the quote, um, but I believe it's Martin Luther King Jr. that has a, he speaks about um, a riot being the, the voice for the voiceless. Mm -hmm. Because that's all you can do mm -hmm. is is you're you are that frustrated with a system that is not hearing you, mm -hmm. and so I don't think that talking on its own does anything. But I think that if we're speaking, if we engage in dialogue in order to learn more about each other's what mm -hmm. aren't what my needs are, what your needs are, how you are experiencing something and how I'm experiencing something, so we separate ourselves out a little bit mm -hmm. to be able to understand that even if you and I have the exact same. Uh, experience, mm -hmm. I might feel it differently mm -hmm. than you will feel it. Mm -hmm. We might both go shopping at Sobeys together and you will be treated differently than I will be treated. Mm -hmm. And so with that being the case, you might leave and say, that was a horrible time. And I might leave and say, that was the best time. They were mm -hmm. so friendly. Yeah. We have to be able to have conversations about that and not personalize them, Yeah. which is not easy to do. I think that's yeah. part of when we yeah. fall into the bigger yeah. traps. But you know what I love about uh, dialogue and conversation and even pouring oneself into the, yeah. the conversation is by the end of, of the time we talk, people most probably discover that they are so similar mm -hmm. in many ways mm -hmm. more than being different. Yeah, and I think that that's a tricky one too. So sometimes we come to certain commonalities when we, ha when we engage in real, like authentic dialogue. Mm -hmm. When I really want to learn about you, mm -hmm. then sometimes that comes. Um, and sometimes we learn, and what I would hope for, is that we learn to value the differences too. Mm -hmm. Like it's okay to be different. Mm -hmm. I think that there's, um, there's a particular type of harm that can happen mm -hmm. when somebody, when we enter into a conversation and we're trying to find only what is the same, mm -hmm. because sometimes it's the thing that's different that I'm most proud of. But, but maybe to use the similarities to build a relationship. Yes, yes, so yes. So I yes. respect how different you are and you respect how different I am. But again, to, to, to have a common ground, you know, to yeah. have something common that we can, we can talk about and relate to each yes. other. This, this, is, this is my point. And that, that is brilliant mm -hmm. because if we're doing this, if we're finding, you know what it is for me? It's about being purposeful. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. Yeah. As I thought it through, yeah. it's about being purposeful. Yeah. If I'm building on my similarities in order to find that common ground of respect so that when I don't agree with you, we can respectfully figure our way out mm -hmm. of that disagreement. If I can do that so that I can honor all of you, the mm -hmm. parts that are the same and the parts that are different, if there's that authentic relationship building, yes. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that a lot of those what many would say are simple starting points are understood and heard differently. Mm -hmm. And so many people in, in trying to find the similarity believe that you can only do that if you erase your difference, mm -hmm. which is why we end up in situations where we talk about melting pots mm -hmm. as the national yeah. rhetoric, right? Yeah. It's to get rid of all the different and now we're going to come. No. Yeah. Sometimes it's about honoring that we are yeah. all different. So, so in a state of melting pot, we, we, we can use the analogy of a mixing pot. Yes. So like, like a salad. So every piece of uh, vegetable has its own distinct um, uh, characteristic, but yes. uh, but again, we are together, are creating something beautiful. Yeah, and that 
I think that is lovely. Yeah. And that's when people start to feel valued. When you feel valued, when you feel um, felt, at one point I had taken a, a parenting course. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, my, uh, this parenting course that I had done was with the Jai Institute. Mm -hmm. And they talked a lot about feeling felt, making sure that your kids feel felt, mm -hmm. feel seen and heard. That's where the, they feel valued. Mm -hmm. So if we can find ways to do that, and that's wonderful. I've actually had, um, when I was in the Faculty of Education, I remember having a bit of an argument with some of my students mm -hmm. because I'm proud of being black. I'm proud of being a black woman. Not, that doesn't mean that I don't like other people. It's just that I take pride yeah. in that. There's, some, there's strength and courage because I stand on the shoulders of my elders and ancestors yeah. who have fought to, yeah. to have me be here and be free, yeah. right? Or freer. Yeah. And my students felt that my pride in being black was racist. Mm. That that was perpetuating racism because it was perpetuating difference as opposed to looking at the similarities. Mm -hmm. So we had some really interesting dialogues about that. Well, this is this is something I talked about in in um, uh, with uh, with Elizabeth Clark mm. that in front of a church there was a big uh, poster of Barbie, mm -hmm. and and the poster says uh, no perfect people are allowed. Ah. So, uh, this made me think, uh, th th this irritated me, mm -hmm. I, I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. Maybe because I grew up with, with, with Barbie, I yeah. loved my Barbies and I still have my Barbies, but, but the word it, itself, no perfect people are allowed. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we teach uh, kids and we, and, and we irritate over and over on this, I'm not perfect, I'm not mm -hmm. perfect, mm -hmm. but when you say this, are you excluding beautiful women? Mm -hmm. Are you excluding athletes? Mm -hmm. Are you excluding smart people? Are mm -hmm. you, so are you doing a reverse discrimination mm -hmm. or, or what? So now when, when you talk about I'm taking pride in my mm -hmm. black blackness or mm -hmm. my, my black history, uh, how we can prevent others to feel this? Because I... I, I I experienced something similar when I talk about uh, my fascination with the ancient Egyptians uh -huh. and their their um, their customs, their beauty, uh, their mm -hmm. beliefs, even their religious religion. So some people think, okay, they they are dead. Why you are keep saying about yeah. ancient Egyptians over and over and over? Yeah, 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 yeah. So reverse discrimination. If we understand how racism, sexism. Uh, transphobia, etc. How it operates, it, it operates systemically. So it's happening within the system, mm -hmm. as opposed to um, just happening in, on the individual level. You'll see that, but the reality is that the, the root cause of mm -hmm. racism, etc., are systems of power and privilege. And so when somebody says that there's reverse discrimination or reverse racism, it's often impossible because the person who they're claiming is enacting racism mm -hmm. doesn't have the power within the system to do that. Okay. And so because it's about power and privilege, mm -hmm. it's not just about me treating you a particular way. It's that when you treat me in this way, a whole system supports it. Mm -hmm. So you're able to say that people shouldn't have dreads if they work in this place mm -hmm. or particular hairstyles aren't allowed, which mm -hmm. happen to be hairstyles that are accustomed to or that black folks would have, or certain head wraps. You aren't allowed to have your head wrap. Mm -hmm. Well, then what do you do if you're a Muslim? And mm -hmm. what, or seek. Or seek. Yeah. What do you do? And so that's when you realize that it's very difficult for you to turn around and say to somebody who seek, for instance, mm -hmm. when they reply, um, but I'm not allowed to, whatever, I don't like the, the owners of this business because a lot of white owners mm -hmm. do this, this, and this and demand these things. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult to say, well, that's being racist because that person does not have the power to mm -hmm. make the rules for that business. Mm -hmm. That's a very, it's not the best example in the world, yeah, but just something to show yeah, that it's about the yeah. power. Well, this, this leads me to my next question, because we are talking about power, privilege, mm -hmm. and equality, discrimination, gender equality. Yeah. So we have claims that saying that women achieved a lot, and yes, we did mm -hmm. in, 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 in many cases, but we still 
the uh, through statistics and some studies that uh, women suffer poverty, mm -hmm. uh, suffer uh, challenges in career advancement, um, uh, domestic violence, yeah. so on. So taking those claims into consideration, did we reach gender equality? That's a, that's a good question. I would have to say no. I think that we've made great gains and strides and that we have a lot of allies that are assisting to help women to get into further um, positions of power, for instance. Mm -hmm. But I also think that the, the question has always been sort of asked superficially mm -hmm. in that we've not attended to the diversity of women mm -hmm. and those that identify as female. Mm -hmm. um, and because we've not attended to that, we'll never get there. And I'm back to even at the very beginning when we talk, when we spoke about the importance of dialogue for action, di mm -hmm. like purposeful dialogue, I think that this is one of the gaps when it comes to our discussions around gender equality. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, even in situations where we say that there are more women in positions of power, if you actually dig a little bit deeper into those statistics, you'll realize that there aren't very many indigenous women in positions of power mm -hmm. or racialized women mm -hmm. or differently abled women in mm -hmm. positions of power. Mm -hmm. There's usually an able-bodied white female yeah. that's in a position of power and then we say we've attained gender equality. Thank you for listening to Corporita Bonanza with Hanan Awed. Catch our next episode on Thursday and don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.corporita.info to receive our articles to learn everything you need to pave your way to success.